Thanks, guys. So uh, I do have a, some copies of the primer if you guys want to take copies of this on the way out. But it, it goes over the basic framework for uh, government labor relations in the state of Missouri. Um, so this talk is on uh, government unions, um, just the public sector unions only. Um, and the theme is uh, about kind of restoring accountability. Um, if, if I get too technical or there's an area you want me to go in, you can kind of interrupt, ask questions. This is more of a forum, but we're going to have Q&A at the end as well. Okay, so first off, as a preliminary matter, what is a government union? How is it different than a traditional union? Um, okay, so you may have heard of public unions, public sector unions, public employee unions, government unions. These are all synonyms. They all mean the same thing. I'm calling them government unions because a, government, a union of government employees uh, is technically not a public organization. It's a private organization, just of people who happen to work for the government. It could be something like a teacher's union, uh, a police union, a firefighter's union, a you know, union of home health care workers or social workers who are employed by the government. Uh, they differ from traditional unions in a couple ways. One is a different body of law regulates their, uh, their labor interactions. Um, another, is, um, another is sort of the dynamics are a little different. With a traditional union, you're, you're uh, negotiating with a, uh, with a private business. So they derive revenues from selling a service. If you're a government union, you're negotiating with the government, with um, a school district or something like that. So they derive revenues from taxation. Um, and uh, the strategy is a little different. Private unions often threaten to withhold services to strike. That's, that's how they get a lot of their leverage. A government union, uh, at least in Missouri, it's not legal for them to strike. Sometimes they do anyway, but uh, they're more effective generally uh, by, um, by lobbying or by um, kind of electioneering political activity because that way they can um, influence the democratic process so that they can get politicians who are more responsive to them. Um, okay, so why are we here? Why are we talking about this? Well, the problem is I've seen a lack of accountability in, uh, in two ways. One is a lack of accountability to, to, to citizens, the public at large. And uh, secondly is sometimes there's a lack of accountability to the workers who are represented by the union. So how does this happen? Um, maybe an example would illustrate. First of all, the lack of accountability to, to a government worker. Um, I've talked to a number of government workers who felt that they weren't adequately represented by their union. Um, a teacher, for example, in uh, St. Louis County who I spoke to, he talked about, uh, well, I'm young, and I'm, uh, you know, I have a, a, a PhD, um, in, and I teach a, a hard science. And uh, the, the NEA, I went to a couple of their meetings, and they're negotiating for this union contract that benefits the people who've been there a lot longer than me, who are a lot less skilled than me. Um, and they're, they're, they, they want a salary schedule that'll say the people in the first five years of being hired can't get any sort of promotion or any raise, and that would give the people at the, who've been there for a couple decades a much higher uh, pay. So he felt that the union didn't rec uh, represent him, and he wanted more of a say in it, but you know, it's, it's sort of hard to, um, to hold them accountable under existing law because of sort of the differences between between uh, the way government unions are run versus private sector unions are run. Uh, also, the accountability to the taxpayers. Um, uh, an example there is there's this, uh, this fire protection district in St. Louis County that I'm thinking of where, um, so fire protection districts, they, uh, they have a three member board generally and the board is elected in an election in April. Uh, generally, there's one special interest who's, who's uh, interested in the outcome of these elections, and that's the firefighters, the firefighters union. So for a while, this, this uh, fire protection district was controlled by uh, sort of board members who were um, more favorable to the fire union's interests. Um, then the recession hit, and things got a little tight. The taxpayers sort of had a, had a mini revolt, and they elected to pro-taxpayer board members to the board, and those people wanted to sort of rein in the kind of abusive spending and uh, what they perceived as abusive spending. Um, they were unable to do so, or they were, they were severely limited in their ability to do so because their hands were tied by the uh, government uh, union contract. So the union contract had this clause. It said that basically the provisions of this contract kind of last indefinitely. They last until the union agrees to a new contract. So government's hands are tied even though the people wanted things to change. So lack of accountability to taxpayers. That's the problem in a, in a nutshell, but I can get more into the, the details. So how did we get here? 
Um, in the, prior to the 1960s, I've got a quote from FDR here. So all government employees should realize that the process of collective bargaining, as usually understood, cannot be transplanted into the public service. Prior to the 1960s, this was the general thought amongst people who were both for labor and, and against labor. I mean, there's no greater friend of, of labor than FDR. Um, George Meany of the AFL-CIO, he said a similar thing. He said, you can't collectively bargain with the government. He said that in 1955. Um, and that was the thought amongst people back then. That was also the, I think, the thought uh, um, in Missouri, too. We have this Supreme Court case from 1947, uh, Klaus, uh, where it said the same thing. It said government unions can, they're free to associate, they're free to exist, but they can't bind the government to a union contract. The, 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 the contract they come to can't be legally binding on the government. So basically, government can't tie its own hands with one of these contracts. So things began to change in the 60s. I've got a picture of JFK up there. Uh, JFK issued the first executive order that gave federal employees the right to collectively bargain. Um, in the 60s, Missouri legislature did a similar kind of move. They passed the public sector labor law, and that created this meet and confer kind of collective bargaining light um, Labor Relations Act for Missouri government employees. It was, Klaus was still, um, still law of the land. If, if, a, if a union negotiated a contract, it wasn't legally binding on the government, but it was a way to have um, teachers or police, or well, it wasn't teachers and police, it was basically everybody but teachers or police uh, active in kind of setting policies for the local government or state government entity they worked for. Teachers and police were um, excluded from the public sector labor law. I think the thinking was that, um, that police and education are too essential of a service to have subject to a labor agreement. That was the thinking at the time. Um, as time went on, the idea of government unions became more accepted. Uh, this came to a head in uh, 2007, where our Supreme Court threw out 60 years of precedent and overturned the Klaus decision and said that, said that a uh, agreement between a government union and a government entity is legally binding on the government. It also said that teachers and police do have a right to collectively bargain. So, um, so th this, this, this arose because uh, one of the big teachers unions in our state, the NEA, sued uh, the independent school district and wanted uh, the policy they had negotiated informally to be legally binding on the school district. So the school district could not change its policies because the union contract said something different. Um, since then, we've seen um, a growth in police union activity, uh, growth in teacher union activity. Uh, there's also more um, court cases since, since independence that have uh, sort of read private sector. Yes? That was retroactive? Um, so that the contract that existed before right. this decision was now legally enforceable? Right, right, right. <laughs> um, so, so there are some problems caused by this, and people on you know, sort of both sides of the political spectrum, uh, all, all sides of the political spectrum, have, have mentioned the legal ambiguity that's created by this case and the subsequent cases. So now you have, um, you have this public sector labor law that was passed in the mid-60s, and you have a series of court cases that say the Missouri Constitution says there's a right to collectively bargain, but it's one phrase. So the court is basically creating this new Labor Relations Act out of one phrase in the Constitution. And as a result, the courts are more heavily involved in government labor relations. Somebody thinks this one phrase in the Constitution means something different, then they'll sue. And we've had a number of, basically the courts are kind of involved in creating this new uh, common law Labor Relations Act. Um, also, the legally binding labor agreements, I already mentioned that. So these, these could be problems. Um, anyway, they're, they're problems that, uh, that also can't, can't be easily solved by legislative action, too. Because the, uh, the court is driving its authority for, um, for producing this new Labor Relations Act from their interpretation of the Constitution. As you know, the legislature, whatever statutes it's passed, are um, below the Constitution. So if you want to address these problems, then you're going to have to amend the Constitution. There's, there's not much you can do there. But um, not to end things on a, on a low note, there, there are things that, that, uh, that the legislature or local governments can do to, to increase accountability for, for both the, the taxpayer and for, the, um, and for the, the government worker, the firefighter or teacher who, who feels that they're not adequately represented. So I've got three reforms right here. So one of them is union elections. 
Uh, currently, currently, government workers, when they're uh, subject to a union, uh, it happens through the certification process. There's a one-time vote, and then they're stuck with the union representation basically indefinitely. There is a decertification process, but it requires uh, filing a petition, getting a number of signatures, and then asking to hold another vote. Uh, I feel that that's not super democratic. Uh, imagine if you voted for the president only one time, and then you were stuck with the guy until, until you uh, could impeach him. Right? We, don't, we don't do things that way. We have regular elections. That's, that's how our democracy usually works. So just have regular union elections. Uh, Wisconsin does it every year, maybe every two years, every four years, something like that. Do it in the open so everybody can see you know, what, they're, what they're voting for and, and make sure government workers are, 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 are adequately represented by uh, union representatives. Uh, these other two are transparency reforms. One is open collective bargaining. So currently the uh, open records and meetings laws says that most, most uh, meetings where uh, government sets policies have to be conducted in the open. Um, but due to sort of a lo legal loophole, uh, government collective bargaining sessions often are held in private sessions and closed sessions. Um, not all local governments do this. The uh, Columbia School District has actually been pretty good about holding a lot of their um, collective bargaining sessions in the open, so members of the public or the press can come and, and watch these and see what's going on. But I'd like to see these spread to other, other local governments. Uh, Monarch Fire Protection District in St. Louis County is another one that holds these meetings in the open. Um, so that's a good reform, and, and that can happen at the local level, or it could be a, a state mandate. Uh, and also financial transparency. So right now, there's this transparency gap between uh, government unions and traditional private sector unions. Um, if you're in a traditional union and you want to see where your dues are going, how they're being spent, you just go online, you go to the federal government's uh, website, uh, the Department of Labor Labor's website, and they have all these financially fi financial filings posted online and you can see basic financial information about your union. There's nothing like that for government unions in the state of Missouri. Um, so have some kind of... Uh, financial transparency filings that, uh, that um, government unions are required to make and uh, post them online so that the taxpayers and the, uh, the teachers or police or firefighters or whoever can see how their dues are being spent. So I think these are a step in the right direction. These are something that can be done without amending the Constitution. They're kind of moderate, balanced you know, approaches to restoring accountability. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd like to hear uh, any of your questions.